Good evening, Converge. It's good to be here with you tonight. Thank you for those who may, were able to make it here in person and for those of you who are watching at home online right now and being good, good people, not watching the playoffs. And uh, I know, I know it's going to be worth it. Chad's got some great teaching dialed up and uh, Jake's going to be leading us in music tonight. But my name is Mitch. I'm the pastor here. And these nights, uh, we're going to be doing this about once a month where uh, we're going to invite a lot of people from our community to come in and lead worship. And I'm going to try to get out of the way as much as possible. So if you're interested in helping out in any capacity, whether it's up front here or behind the scenes back there in the tech booth, it's a good opportunity for you to get engaged uh, that way. But I wanted, to, I wanted to let you know, for those who are here, you can do it on paper. But virtually, we have a virtual connection card. I want to encourage you to fill that out, especially if you're new or newer to Converge. We'd love to get to know you, help you connect uh, with our community as well. And I wanted to talk to you guys for a second. Last weekend was our Engage weekend, and we've been doing those pretty regularly where we shut down church for the weekend, basically to make sure you know how important this is to us and how important it is for us to go out into the community and engage others where they're at in their faith. And so we do that around the table in our homes a little bit, and that's become a little bit smaller these days, but I know I talked to several people. I had some game nights and brought some people in that uh, aren't connected to a church. And uh, one of the things we've been also trying to do is some organized efforts at engaging the community as well through service. And so last weekend, uh, we were loving on Vineyard Assisted Living. And some of you guys may know this, but Carl, uh, who's part of Converge Community, he works there. And one of the things we want to always try to do as much as possible is when we're doing service-oriented projects, we want to make sure that there's some kind of natural connection to that point. And so it's a great opportunity for us to not only love uh, the residents at Vineyard, but also the staff, uh, all of which uh, Carl is part of that staff. And so he keeps those connection points with them uh, and with our church. And I know some cool opportunities will open up there. But we did some cool things. Uh, we gave them goodie bags uh, full of cookies and some puzzle books for the residents, and then for the staff, a Big B gift card, because they're right around the corner there from Big, Bu Big B, and uh, as well as a, a kind of a staff card. But I wanted to invite Carl up here to share a little bit about kind of what happened and uh, what their maybe reactions were and some of the things he heard. So if you want to come up, Carl, you can share uh, your experiences, because you were right there on the ground floor, and, and fortunately, being a resident, you were able to be in there right with them, too. Yeah. Thank you, and good evening. Um, yeah, it was a total blessing. Um, we really did bless the residents. They just uh, would not stop thanking me uh, for what we had done for them. Um, they really do not have the opportunity to go to church. Um, they're kind of locked in. Some families with COVID uh, would take their loved ones out to uh, church service, but most of them are uh, shut in there. Um, so they were uh, totally grateful. I have several thank you cards from them. Um, our company boss uh, was uh, ecstatic over what we had done. Uh, it went real smooth. I was able to uh, bless the meal mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just received uh, just nonstop compliments and thanking uh, us for what they we had done for them. Awesome. Well, thanks for not only uh, sharing that with us, Carl, but kind of leading the charge. He and John Ryan were leading the charge in that, getting all that around and having the opportunity. So I, I don't know if I mentioned it. We also fed them lunch, too, uh, which is a nice blessing I heard for them, uh, eating a lot of cafeteria food, being able to get some, like, takeout. So, um, but coming up next week, we have our birthday bash. If you can believe it, one week or one year from next week, we've been around for a whole year, which is crazy to think about. The last weekend of January last year was the first time a big group of us met in the Bridge Gym as the beginning of our launch team. And here we are a year later and still kicking. And it's been a crazy year. And we want to celebrate not only uh, what God has been doing and has done this year, but look ahead to what we believe he will do. And so this is a great opportunity just to come and celebrate. Really, that's going to be a big focus of uh, the, the day next Sunday. But it's also an opportunity if you are uh, 
maybe new to Converge, you get to learn more about who we are. If you've been kind of uh, hanging out a little bit, it's an opportunity to get deeply or deeper connected with who we are. But uh, if you have friends who are interested, this is a great opportunity to invite them. We have a, we're going to be in person and virtual. If you are going to attend virtually, please let me know. We have an RSVP uh, online for that. I forgot to queue up Sarah, who's running our Facebook Live right now with that link, but we will get that link to you because we're going to be doing some things here in person that we don't want you to miss out on. And so I'm going to get that to you ahead of time this week so you're ready for it and uh, we'll be able to participate that way. Um, but the other thing is that we've been kind of, as we've been steering uh, or leaning more into our virtual services, we're going to start gearing more into the in-person services. And there's some people here now, uh, but part of that is getting our Converge kids going again. And we've been kind of hit pause on that since really uh, November when everything kind of shut down again. But starting next weekend, we'll have full Converge kids and hopefully from there on out. So uh, if you have little ones and that's something that's been important, know that that's coming we want to encourage you, as long as you're comfortable, to start coming in person, and uh, we're going to be doing that more often. After the birthday, we're going to have a new series coming. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but we have some fun stuff planned, and so that Sunday uh, after the birthday bash will be the first weekend of that series that we're going to be in until Easter, and so I want to encourage you to uh, make sure you're ready for that. It's going to be coming out of the book of Philippians. There's a little bit of a teaser there. And uh, we have some exciting things planned for that as well. So that's it for uh, the announcements. But I want to invite my daughter, Kaylee, up. She's going to be uh, reading from Hebrews 9 today. And that's going to lead into Chad's message that he's going to start here right after she gets done reading in our first worship song. So come on up, Kaylee, and you can lead us in this first reading. Yeah, so this is Hebrews 9, 1 through 8. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place for worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were a lampstand, a table, and sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room is called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was a second room called the most holy place. In that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered in gold on all sides. Inside the ark were a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves, and sewn tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priests ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people had committed in, 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 in ignorance. Um, by these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle in the system it, re it represented was still in use. Hi, everybody. My name is Jake. I'm a worship leader here at Converge. And uh, we're going to play a song today. This is an old song. Uh, Better is One Day in Your House. We're excited for this one. This is, uh, this is a song that hopefully a, a number of you will know. And if you're at home or if you're here in the room with us, we would, we would hope that you would wor worship along with me while I get this song going. So uh, here in the room, if you guys would stand up, we're going to start singing this song and uh, hopefully have a good time here. Yeah. 
With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Chad now. All right. Thanks, Jake. Good afternoon, Converge family, here and out there in the Webernet somewhere. So we're going to continue our study on Exodus today. And so Exodus is this wonderful story of the nation of Israel being liberated from their oppression and slavery under the kingdom of Egypt. And it's a chronological order describing to the reader about how Moses was anointed, how he rose to power, and then ultimately through, through Moses with God's power, they unleash these plagues on Egypt, which forces Pharaoh's hand for Israel's deliverance. You know, after that, we've talked a little bit the last few weeks about Israel's journey through the wilderness, and we learn a lot from of God's lesson for that, as well as the laws that God gives on how the Israelites are to uh, encounter and have the relationship with God. And I know we've heard from Mackenzie and Jake and Matt Furrow and John over the past three weeks, uh, a number of lessons that we can take today from this story of the nation of Israel. Then Mitch asked me if I'd be interested in talking about the last um, message uh, from Exodus. So I'm literal probably to a fault. So when I said the, the last part of Exodus, I went to the last part of Exodus. And if you're familiar with it, the last five chapters, so chapters 35 to 40, capture in a lot of detail, right? Lots of cubits and other things and mina and shekels 
um, the design and the construction of the tabernacle. Uh, and the tabernacle is the place where God's glory comes down and dwells among his people. And then I thought, like, didn't we just go over this like five chapters before? And sure enough, like chapters 25 through 30 have almost word for word the same text of here's how you are to build the tabernacle and the same amount of cubits, shekels, and mina to be accounted for. And I am not a biblical scholar. Um, Actually, by education, I'm a statistician. And um, as a lot of my friends will tell you, statisticians are just people that didn't have quite enough personality to become accountants. So, um, but not being a biblical scholar, I do know one thing is that in the Hebrew culture and language um, that they use repetition as a method for um, asserting the importance around that topic. And so I was wondering, this must have been important if God decided to recount this two times in the book of Exodus. So I've done some research over the past um, past two weeks and kind of thinking about what would be important for us to take away from the tabernacle. But before we get to that, I want to make sure everyone's grounded in what the tabernacle is. So we've got an image up here, and on the left side of the screen, you see a layout of the entire, um, uh, the entire tab- tabernacle um, courtyard. And that courtyard measured about 150 feet by 75 feet. We're going to use, you know, English units, today's measurement, so it's easier to understand. So roughly half a football field is this outer courtyard. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you see just a shot of um, the actual tent of meeting, which is about 15 feet by 30 feet. So that's like a two-car garage, right? So we have a two-car garage parked inside of a half a football field. That's like this place of worship that we have. Now, the courtyard around, again, half a football field, is like seven and a half high curtains made of linen, fine linen, on poles that are anchored into bases cast of solid bronze. So like this is a pretty substantial structure that we have. The tent itself, you see those boards there, it was approximately 10 feet high, and each of these planks of wood are set into a base that holds them upright that's cast out of pure silver. Right? This, this is... This is the place that God is going to be um, worshipped by his people. Um, There's a veil within that tent that goes between the holy place and the holies of holies. And I couldn't find a specific reference, but they said the the breadth of a hand, right? So the curtain's thickness, the thickness of this cloth, right, is like as wide as your hand. It took hundreds of people to actually move this and hang it every time they were setting up this tent. Within the courtyard and within the Holy of Holies, we have things cast of solid bronze, like the altar and the basin. We have things cast of pure gold, like the lampstand and the um, incense, and then the ark itself in the Holy of Holies, like almost three feet by four feet. It's like two and a half by four feet, roughly. Solid gold top. I mean, I'm trying to just give you a picture of what this is before we go into the study about it. Okay, so this is the tabernacle. And I think God going through all of this discussion in detail and measurement about how it was to be constructed and then the actual construction teaches us a few things. Is one, it teaches us that it is uh, important. Right? God felt it was important for how he was going to dwell among his people. And he wanted his people to place importance on his presence being among them. The second thing is that it is intentional, right? If you think about the significance of this structure and the priestly garments and everything else, it creates an environment where you don't just casually like wander into worship. It's a process, and it's a big process, and that puts them in the right mindset, the priests and the entire nation of Israel, to worship God through that intentionality. So it's important, it's intentional, and last, it gives us insight. And so we read one passage from Hebrews, and we're going to come back to that, about the tabernacle is a beautiful insight into the coming Messiah, which was fulfilled through Jesus' uh, life and and, uh, ministry. So we're going to go through those one at a time, and we're going to start with the um, importance. And uh, I'm going to read to you as the initial uh, description here um, of how God placed importance. And this is in Exodus 35. So in Exodus 35, starting with verse 4, it says, Moses said to the whole Israelite community, This is what the Lord has commanded. 
From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze, of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, of goat hair, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, other types of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and fragrant incense, onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the aphid and, aphid and breastpiece. All who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. So this is a offering unto the Lord from the nation of Israel. Right? So we have several million Israelite people journeying through the wilderness, and they're to pause here and build this structure of where God is going to dwell among them. And, and it, is, it is significant that they, there is a paradigm shift here within the Exodus story of up until this point, if we just go one chapter back um, in Exodus 33, the tent of meeting, as Moses erected it, used to say this in, in 33.7. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside a camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. And anyone inquiring to the Lord would go to that tent of meeting outside of camp. So this is different because if you pull up this image, now there's a different structure. The tabernacle becomes the center of the Jewish community. All 12 nations of 12 tribes of Israel encamp around it. And they're going to schlep this thing across the desert, right? And set it up in the same way every time. And now God has come from, mo- from being outside of the camp in this tent of meaning, say, I'm going to come and I'm going to dwell among my people. It, it's subtle, but it is important uh, in the story. So the Israelites people, they take this offering, the skilled laborers build this incredible structure, and then they're, you know, they're humping it through the desert. And they are to set this up on the first day of every month And they moved this with them as they migrated. And if you just think about the magnitude, if you go back and you convert this into today's um, units, we talked about the size. But if you account for the offering that was taken from the people, I'm a nerd, so I put in a spreadsheet, right? There's there's 1,900 pounds of gold, roughly, 6,700 pounds of silver, 4,700 pounds of bronze, and then you put on top of that acacia wood, linen, leather, cashmere. So let's forget the labor. If you just take the labor out of it, which was significant, if you just look at the cost in today's dollars, this was a $60 million investment for the nation of Israel. So, if you, to, right? so pause and think about that. That's $60 million to build a tent, right? It's a tent. This is, I mean, this is Old Testament glamping, right? So... <laughs> But it does represent a substantial investment from the people. And God is saying, this is to be important to you, important above all, uh, above all other things. You know, later in Jesus' ministry, he teaches us in Matthew 6, 21, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And I, I don't want to stay anchored only on the financial aspect of this, but everything we put ahead of the Lord is something that we are treasuring in our heart. So the the nation of Israel made a huge investment of financial investment, of a labor investment, and then to move this thing with them and set this up in this fashion every time. We need to question ourselves. So we're going to put up some questions for reflection here. As we think about the importance that God placed on dwelling among his people, how much do you value God's presence? And you can answer that and try to answer honestly. And if you're out there watching, you know, feel free to engage on the Facebook community as well. Like, do, how much do you value God's presence? Would the people around you see that in your life? So we're going to just take a minute, minute, minute and a half here and just reflect on that and just kind of think about what the example of the Israelites here.
you had an opportunity to discuss that wherever you're joining into our um, teaching today. So first, we learn that it's important. God has an importance about dwelling among his people. The second is it causes the need for intentional worship um, and an opportunity for us to prepare our hearts and our minds with the amount of time it would take, the attention paid, and the detail so that we could better, so the Israelite nation could better comprehend like God's glory coming down to dwell among them. So we're going to reflect on this. Again, we're going to go back to the uh, Israelites um, in the wilderness here, and I'm going to read, and it's a, it's a long passage, but bear with me here, right? Just so you understand what had to happen when they were going to set up the tabernacle. So we're in Exodus 40 here. Then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day of the first month. Place the Ark of the Covenant law in it and shield the Ark with the curtain, or the veil. Bring in the table and set out what belongs on it. Bring in the lampstand and set up the lamps. Place the gold altar of incense in front of the Ark of the Covenant law and put the curtain at the entrance of the tabernacle. Place the altar of burnt offering in front of the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, Place the basin where the tent of meeting and the altar, uh, and put between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it. Set up the courtyard around it, and put the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. Take the anointing oil, anoint the tabernacle and everything in it, consecrate it and all its furnishings, and it will be holy. Then anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils. All its utensils consecrate the altar, and it will be most holy. Anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate them. Then bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then dress them in the sacred garments, anoint him, consecrate him so he may serve as high priest. Bring his sons in and dress them in their tunics. Anoint them just as you anointed the father so they may serve me as priests. Their anointing will be to their priesthood that will continue throughout the generations. And Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded. We, we, there's a lot to set up for this worship service with the technology, right? But that, that's a substantial investment every time. Get back to the scale of this thing. It's half a football field. There's thousands of pounds of metal. Like, it's a big investment for them to set this up. And then the priests have these specific garments they're going to wear. Go ahead, pull up the picture of these handsome devils, right? Like, like, this has to put them in the frame of mind to be ready to encounter God. The whole process of setting up the tent, being dr- dressed and anointed, they go through these phases where they progress through the, the outer door into the courtyard. Of the, they call this the justification phase, they, the sanctification and the holy phase. And only the high priest right, is allowed to go into the holy of holies in, before the presence of God. You know, it's similar to like professional athletes. Um, if you watch basketball, professional basketball players, they dribble in the same rhythm with the same hands, same number of dribbles every time before they take a free throw to get in that mindset. I remember watching Michael Phelps when he would swim in the Olympics, and he would do the same warm-up and that crazy thing, because his arms are way longer than mine, where he could like slap the back of his shoulders every time before he got on the starting blocks. And whether you're taking a test or doing something um, significant in sports or professionally, um, assuming you're not a professional athlete, there's probably a rhythm you go through to get yourself in the mindset. And this was their rhythm of worship. And it helps them become not only ritualistically pure, but that puts them ready. And this process get, goes on and is expanded in Leviticus, right? In Leviticus, we have all of these um, processes, these religious uh, outlines for doing like the burnt offering, then the grain offering, and the fellowship offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. Like, we only have one offering here, right? And even some churches still call that voluntary. So um, th- there's a lot of process around this. And then the priests themselves, there's an ordination of the priest. There's rules for the priest. There's the garments that they go on. There's this progression of what they need to go through. All of this creates a situation that is very intentional worship, where they are prepared, heart and mind, to encounter God and to worship God. And don't mistake my meaning. I kind of like wearing jeans and a hoodie to church. Like, we don't, I don't think we should be putting on ephids, right, or like go back to wearing suits on Sunday. I mean, if that's your jam, that's cool. But, but are we at risk sometimes, and maybe I'm looking to you, Facebook community at home, who are still in your pajama pants, like, 
Are we at risk of not preparing ourselves to encounter God in worship? So we're going to pull up some more reflection questions for us. We talked about importance. Now let's talk about intentional. Like, how do I approach God in worship? You know, back when we used to come to church, <laughs> everyone come to church in person. I have three young kids, so sometimes you were running in two minutes earlier, usually five minutes late, and trying to engage in worship. But how, like, how are you really preparing your heart and mind now when we're going to engage at four o'clock on a Sunday, right? And let's reflect on that for a few minutes. Discuss with your families at home. Like, what's one small thing you could do to better prepare your heart to encounter God? Facebook community when you're out there, maybe share with the rest of uh, the church here, you know, what are some things you do do? What's um, one thing that you would like to look to to become more intentional about worship? So we've talked about the importance God places on this, the importance of God's presence dwelling among his, among his people. We talked about the um, intentionality that we should bring to worship. And the last thing we want to talk about is insight to the coming Messiah. So the tabernacle becomes a beautiful fro- prophecy that's fulfilled through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. You know, we, we read from Hebrews uh, earlier, and in that it's interesting, right? So the Holy of Holies, God's presence comes down and dwells in the tabernacle, and only one person of the entire nation of Israel had the privilege of going in there, and even at that, once a year. So once atoned for in the sins, at the predefined hour by God, were they allowed to come into God's presence? The prophecy begins in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, we hear this, this account of Isaiah is in the throne room of God, right? And he's terrified. He's before God, and he's been raised a good Jew, right? He knows he is not supposed to be in the Holy of Holies. And he falls on his face, and he's weeping, and he says, I am a man of un- unpure lips. And a seraphim comes, and takes a burning hot coal and touches it to his lips and tells him that his sins are atoned for. This is significant from the the pivot of the Holy of Holies. This is the first account that we have in the Bible of God's holiness going out and making something else pure. Until then, the nation of Israel had to atone for their sins, had to ritualistically wash before they could come into God's presence. Now, this is the first indication that we have of God has a plan where he is going to reach out and he has a way to purify the world. And it starts with this vision that we have um, in Isaiah, which is significant because this becomes the model for his Christ. Uh, Later on in Ezekiel uh, chapter 47, and this is another just invigorating text to read. It's very (laughs) long with a lot of cubits and measuring rods, so I'm not going to read it to you. But I'll summarize. Ezekiel has this vision of the entire temple. And then at the end of his vision, He's standing there with his guide, and there's a trickle of water coming out of the Holy of Holies. So, again, God's presence is in this one area on the Ark of the Covenant, right, inside the Holy of Holies. So, in the, the, what will become the temple, God's presence is in there, and he sees there's a trickle of water coming out of there into the world. And water is used as symbolism for life, for purification, for cleansing. 
and he walks with his guide, and it begins as a trickle. And think about that, a trickle, one man, Jesus. Jesus is able to go into the Holy Holies and bring God's presence out into the world. As he walks on, it becomes a stream, ankle deep. It's the first church. The first church on Pentecost receives God's Holy Spirit and now is able to take that holiness out into the world. He walks on and it becomes a river with uh, vegetation on both sides and ultimately empties into the Dead Sea and we're told it makes the Dead Sea pure, fresh water. This is an amazing vision and prophecy that we have of not only will God's holiness come out of the temple, but with an intent, an intent to renew and restore and redeem in the world. We are no longer bound by this. We will, we will no longer be bound by this model of God is in one place and we must cleanse ourselves to go into his presence. This vision became realized in Jesus. Jesus became the tabernacle. And actually, in John 1.14, I feel like we should pull up the fact check here for, for Mitch, just to double check my Greek research here. But um, in John 1.14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Greek word that the author chooses for dwelt is skinu, which literally would be the same thing you would say as dwelling in a tent. So in, in modern Greek, it would say to, to set up a tent, like a tabernacle. In fact, They use the same root word, and they use skeni later in Hebrews to refer to the tabernacle. So the early church, the first church, quite literally translated Jesus to be the representation, the fulfilling of the tabernacle. Um, I want to pull up a simple schematic, and this is not a very elaborate one because um, it's just easier to see everything called out here. So again, that's our half a football field, if you will, and the entrance to the outer court was always to face east, and there's one way into the courtyard. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except for me. One way, represented through Christ's ministry. As you enter the the outer courtyard, and you go through this process of justification, we have the altar of burnt offering, where they placed uh, sacrifices, and it was cast out of pure bronze, which what the, um, the nation of Israel there recognized at the time, bronze represented judgment. So we were making a sacrifice on the altar of God's judgment. Jesus is described as the Lamb of God in John 1.29. He's described in 1 Peter as a lamb without blemish or spot, which would be that perfect lamb they would sacrifice on the one day a year that the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Between the altar and the holy place, we have the bronze lava or the basin where the priests would be ceremoniously ceremonially washed to represent cleansing just as Jesus taught the practice of baptism. Even in our great commission in Matthew 28, 19, we are to go out to, to make believers of the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a representation. We know it's not a physical washing away of the sins, but that is the same process that we see represented in the tabernacle. As you enter the holy place, there's there's three important artifacts that are within there. The first is the table of showbread. What was on the table of showbread? Bread and wine. Jesus called himself, I am the bread of life. The very bread that the priests would eat to sustain themselves as they were preparing for worship. There's a lampstand, it's a big menorah that's in there, the lampstand which provided light into the holy place, and Jesus described himself, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Also in the holy place, the altar of incense. Uh, Many times in in the Bible, prayer is referred to as a fragrant offering to God. In Revelations 5, 8, they say it specifically where um, the fragrance of prayer Prayer enters God's nostril. So we see our um, representation of communion and prayer and light. And separating the holy place from the holy of holies was the veil. Again, we said this is a piece of fabric that's substantial, about as wide as your hand. This shielded man from God's glory, right? Not because God was being exclusive. It was to protect man. If we went in there unclean, we would not survive in God's presence. 
that is torn away. At Jesus' death, Matthew 27, 5, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The veil between the holy place and the holy holies has been torn. Jesus fulfills that. And just like Ezekiel's vision, God's grace, God's purity comes out to atone for our sins out of the holy place and into the world. But before we get there, the holy of holies, what's in there? This is the very presence of the Lord in our terrestrial world for the Israelites. Within that, we have the Ark of the Covenant, right? The top of the Ark of the Covenant was called the Cover of Atonement, and there are two cherubim touching wings, and right at that point is a place that they called the Mercy Seat, which has scriptural references and songs of God, of Jesus will take his place upon the Mercy Seat. Between the law of God, which is inside the ark, and the glory of God sits this place on the golden lid that once a year the high priest would offer a sacrifice for the sins of the nation. They would place the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the nation. Does this sound familiar? This this is what Jesus proclaimed he was doing for the world. The tabernacle is rich, rich with symbolism of the coming, coming Messiah. The details that we see within this are a physical expression um, of shadows of what would be fulfilled in reality. And many Jews came to that belief, right? Not all, we know not all, but in the early church, many Jews came to the belief that Jesus was fulfilling uh, this, um, this prophecy. And beyond that, we see Acts. So not just Jesus as a person, but Jesus in his ministry, where he comes out and he makes the unclean pure. Just like we saw the the coal that touched uh, Isaiah's lips or Ezekiel's streams of living water, he comes out. And who does he help? He helps the possessed and the lepers and the prostitutes and tax collectors and Pharisees and even the dead. He is able to restore, refresh, and renew, just like we see in the vision of Ezekiel. But... What's really interesting and very humbling is that it doesn't stop there with Christ. We are told in New Testament teaching that we become God's temple. We become the tabernacle. Ephesians chapter 2. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles, right, that's That's us, just so you guys know what he's talking about, right? Us. We are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Are we comprehending the significance of this? A nation of Israel schlepped thousands of pounds, $60 million tent through the desert just so God would, you know, spend one day a year with them. And we are told here in the New Testament that through Jesus' sacrifice, God wants to live in our very being is humbling. And another, another interesting thing, tie the cross reference this back to Ezekiel's uh, vision. We're told in John chapter 7, who, he who believes in me, as scripture said, from his innermost being will be flow rivers of living water. We become exactly what we see in Ezekiel. We become the tabernacle where God's purity to redeem, restore, and renew actually comes out of us. Like, I want to be there. I want to be there in the Holy of Holies. I want to have confidence in that. I'm going to have Jake come up here as we wrap up and we have our last uh, questions to reflect on. Jesus tore the veil between God's presence and the world. This enabled his Holy Spirit to come and sanctify the early church and eventually us. Like We don't have to anymore, like the nation of Israel, go to a physical place and offer blood offerings for our sins just so we can be in God's presence. But there's a serious question here. As we think about that insight, this vision that we have, like, do you believe that? Do you believe Christ's life and ministry was a fulfillment of that tabernacle prophecy? Do you believe that you become the dwelling place of God? Like, where are you at in that journey to his presence? The priests would go through the same journey of justification, sanctification, and glorification. Have you considered and do you believe Are you going in the process of working with Jesus to become more like him? Do you want God's glory to reside within you? Take a few minutes to reflect on that, and then we'll come back to it.
wrap it up. All right, once again, we are going to enter into a phase of worship. And this first song that we're going to talk about, uh, or that we're going to sing together, is Holy, Holy, Holy. One of the things that I could really want to implore you guys to do is to look at the lyrics and really feel those lyrics and relate to the idea of a $60 million tent that we're hauling around town here. And, and think about uh, you know, how this song kind of reminds you of, of everything that was written about uh, and the, the importance that got placed upon this by by speaking of it twice, um, by clearly identifying every step of this way two times. This is a really important thing to him, and so it should be important to us too. So we're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. Uh, reflect on the lyrics as we're going through this, but I want to encourage you to sing along with us as well, so it always makes me feel better. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do then is to stand up, and we'll get started with this one. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee. Casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and all. Holy, 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 oh, I thee, though the eye of sinful men thy glory may not see, only thou art holy. and 
purity. And holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy earn in earth and sky and sea. We've got one more song here. This is Evidence by Josh Baldwin. This is a song that we started playing here with Converge, oh, I don't know, probably a half a year ago. And this has just kind of sort of become our, our anthem, if you will, uh, the evidence of God's presence and his glory all around us. Uh, I just love this song. I'm, I'm so excited to finish with this one. So <clears throat> if you guys would sing along with me. Once I get my guitar in the right spot. Promises and fulfillment. 
sit down. I feel compelled to pray. Just, Lord, uh, we thank you for the rich vision of uh, your tabernacle, and the song got to me. I just, I just pray that we would be, our eyes would be open to that evidence. Our eyes would be open to you as our true Savior, that the world would look to us and see evidence of your dwelling within us in our lives. Amen. All right. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. We've got a couple of things to recap. Um, remember, we have the connection card, so coming up on Facebook Live, you should see the, um, the link going out to those. If you would like to find out a little bit more about how to get connected with this church, that's a, the best way to do it, so we know how to get in touch with you. Also, next week uh, is the birthday bash, coming up on one year old uh, for the Converge community, and we would love if you could join us in person uh, here at Center Avenue Church of God. If you can't make that happen and you're more comfortable to connect in remotely, understood, but please, please come join us for that. Uh, last thing is the offering. So we have the ability to uh, give here in person. We also have the ability to give online via, via the, the website, uh, which is up on the link now. Um, our commitment, our intentionality, our importance to God um, is expressed of those of us who have made a decision to believe and commit to this church community. So we'd love to you to join us in that. I'm going to end by reading a passage from Hebrews. We started out in Hebrews 9, and we're going to end up here in uh, starting at verse 11 through 14. So we heard the, the early church, the tabernacle, God's glory, but separated from the nation of Israel. Only the high priest went in once per year to atone for the sins of the nation. Here we see in Hebrews 9, 11, but when Christ came as high priest, the good things that uh, are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made by human hands. That is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter that holy of holy place. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats or calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of the goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkle, sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, will cleanse our consciousness, our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve a living God. Um, Thanks so much for joining us this week. Again, we hope to see you back next week for our birthday bash. Um, old school Lutheran benediction here for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you, upon you with favor and give you peace. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a great week.